So um, thank you for joining us today for Quality Improvement Tools for Patient-Centered Programs. Uh, my name is Ann Willis, and I'm the Director of the Center for the Advancement of Cancer Survivorship Navigation and Policy and the Director of our Division of Cancer Survivorship here at the GW Cancer Institute. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to take a couple minutes to go over just a few housekeeping remarks. Um, we ask everyone to keep your phones on mute to avoid any background noise and any disruption during the program. Um, and I wanted to point out that today's program is being recorded. And we are going to be using the Q&A feature for this webinar. So if you look at the bottom right-hand side of your screen, there's a Q&A box. If at any time during the presentation you have a question, feel free to use that box to type in your question. And then when we get to the end of the webinar, um, we'll go through the questions in the Q&A box and we'll um, have some time to answer those questions. And as a note before we get started, too, we will send out a PDF of all the slides and a link to the archived webinar um, for all the webinar participants. And the recording will be also archived on our website, along with the other webinars that we've done in the past. So I wanted to take a moment to go over today's agenda. I will provide a brief overview of our Center for the Advancement of Cancer Survivorship Navigation and Policy. And then we will move into the presentation with me and Heather Kapp as your presenters. And then we will wrap up the webinar with a participant Q&A using the Q&A box on the bottom right of your screen. Um, so I wanted to provide a brief overview of the Center for the Advancement of Cancer Survivorship Navigation and Policy, which brings you today's webinar. Um, we call the Center CA SNAP. And it was created in 2009 through a generous grant from the Pfizer Global Health Partnerships Program. And the mission of the center is to advance cancer survivorship and patient navigation efforts locally and nationally through education and training, policy analysis, outreach, and research. And the center offers survivorship and navigation resources that are available online at our website and through a monthly e-newsletter. Um, we send additional materials out through our CA SNAP listserv to over 2,000 subscribers. We write white papers, create case studies, and work cooperatively with other healthcare organizations to advance patient-centered care. And we also share summaries of meetings and roundtables that we've hosted to catalyze patient navigation, cancer survivorship, and other patient-centered care initiatives. Uh, through CA SNAP, historically we've offered several trainings, and we were recently awarded funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to help us translate our existing in-person trainings to an online format to make those available at no charge for participants. And we'll start with our executive training on navigation and survivorship, which is a nuts and bolts training for building and sustaining navigation and survivorship programs. And we will also be developing a competency-based patient navigator training that will be available through the online academy as well. Today's webinar is part of the CA SNAP monthly webinar series, which we launched in April of last year. We feature a variety of topics related to navigation and survivorship based on feedback from healthcare professionals across the country. Um, and then we also have several research initiatives that um, we provide updates on through CA SNAP. So you can find archived webinars on these results, on our website, along with any reports that we've done that accompany them. Um, and our goal really is to share the findings so we can provide you with information to help you provide patient-centered care. So if there are any topics that you're particularly in, in, interested in learning more about, feel free to send us an email. So the email address is on the screen, and that's casnp at gwu.edu. And here is some more information about our CA SNAP resources. You can visit our website to see webinars and reports. Um, I'd also like to encourage you to check out our free Cancer Survivorship e-learning series for primary care providers at the link on the screen. So that's cancersurvivorshipcentereducation.org. And we actually have a lot of oncology professionals complete the program who find it really useful. Um, and we recently launched some new modules on health promotion and care coordination. Our next webinar will take place on March 19th from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern Time, and it will cover cancer and fertility, so we're excited about that. Uh, and then following this webinar, you will receive an email with a recording, um, an evaluation survey, and um, a PDF of today's slides as well.
So here are your speakers today. Again, I'm Ann Willis, Director of CA SNAP and Director of our Division of Cancer Survivorship. Um, and also presenting is Heather Kapp, our Director of Access and Quality here at GW. Our goal with this webinar is to provide you with some free and easy quality improvement tools to consider as you're developing and improving your patient-centered programs. So we'll talk about some tools and then we'll go into some real examples of how we've incorporated these tools here at GW. Um, before we get started with that, though, I want to make sure um, that we define patient-centeredness as a function of quality care, and then we'll describe quality and process improvement strategies and tools, and then we'll review some examples of quality and process improvements using these strategies and tools. So first off, what is quality care? So the Institute of Medicine um, defines quality care as being comprised of these six components. So the first one is safety, which means avoiding injuries to patients from the care that is intended to help them. Um, effectiveness is providing services based on scientific knowledge to all who could benefit and refraining from providing services to those not likely to benefit, so avoiding underuse and overuse. Um, Patient-centeredness we'll get to next. Timeliness means reducing waits and sometimes harmful delays for both those who receive and those who give care. Efficiency is about avoiding waste, in particular waste of equipment, supplies, ideas, and energy. And being equitable means providing care that does not vary in quality because of personal characteristics such as gender, ethnicity, geographic location, and socioeconomic status. So you can see patient-centeredness is an important component of quality care, and it's something that we should continually be thinking about in our quality improvement efforts. So what exactly is patient-centeredness? Well, before we get to the definition, I wanted to show you a quote that I think indicates the importance of patient-centeredness, specifically in cancer care. Um, so this quote is from an article, and the quote says, for diseases that are often chronic and sometimes incurable, with interventions that can have toxic and long-term consequences, it is especially important that decisions influencing patient outcomes reflect the patient's own perspective. Cancer provides a compelling case in point. So, I'm going to come back to this idea of why patient-centeredness um, is important in just a minute, and we'll talk more about that. So what does patient-centered actually mean? This term is currently a buzzword, um, and it's used in a lot of different ways. So in preparing this presentation, I wanted to find the definition, so I did what we do nowadays, and I Googled it. Um, and so I found a lot of different words that are used in association with patient-centeredness. And these are just some of the things that came up from a quick Google search. Um, so some of the things that stand out to me are whole person care, responsiveness, patient preference, integration of care. Um, but you can see that there, there's a lot of different definitions um, or attributes of patient-centeredness. So here's the Institute of Medicine definition of patient-centered care, and I've highlighted the words that I think are important. So patient-centered care is health care that establishes a partnership among practitioners, patients, and their families when appropriate to ensure that decisions respect patients' wants, needs, and preferences, and that patients have the education and support they need to make decisions and participate in their own care. So in 2010, Epstein et al. published a great article in Health Affairs on patient-centered health care. So I highly recommend reading it if you have access to it, and the citation is listed on the slide. Um, but the authors talk about why we should be focused on patient-centeredness, and they identify these five reasons. So first, patient-centeredness is just the right thing to do. It's morally and ethically the right thing to do. Um, but evidence also shows that patient-centered care can improve care by improving disease-related outcomes and quality of life, as well as better adherence to medication. Patient-centered care can also lead to improved well-being um, directly by reducing anxiety and depression and indirectly um, by building trust and social support, which can help patients better cope. It also helps to bridge the differences between providers and patients, which can help mitigate health disparities. And finally, patient-centered care can lead to better value by reducing costs, reducing lawsuits, promoting a healing relationship, and contributing to patient safety. 
And we just talked about what patient-centeredness is and why it's important, but it's equally critical to understand what patient-centeredness is not. Um, and so again, this is from the Epstein article, um, and I think it's something that's really important to keep in mind. So patient-centeredness is not just giving patients what they want when they want it, regardless of value or cost. It's also not simply capitulating to patients' requests. And it's certainly not throwing information at people and leaving them to sort it out on their own. So I think these are important things to keep in mind when we're thinking about patient-centeredness. And finally, Epstein et al. point out that patient-centeredness depends on these three things. So it depends on having a supportive healthcare environment, depends on receptive and responsive healthcare professionals, and it depends on an informed and involved patient. So patient-centered quality improvement, then, should really be focusing on all three of these areas. When we talk about quality and process improvement, it's important to keep a few things in mind. So first of all, quality improvement or process improvement is really about thinking about systems or processes. So the goal is to think about how to improve the system. And you really have to think about the bigger system and not just a single point in time or a single part of the system. So for example, a patient doesn't just show up for an office visit. There's a whole system that gets the patient into the visit. It may include having a patient schedule the appointment with a staff, um, having the patient fill out forms in the waiting room, seeing a provider, and having a patient navigator follow up after the visit. The second thing that's important to remember is that quality improvement is not about blaming people. Um, and I think sometimes this gets a little bit lost when we think about quality and process improvement. Um, but we're not trying to say that Dr. X or Administrator Y is a bad person or intentionally doing things wrong. Systems emerge and change over time, often as a result of external forces. Sometimes systems worked initially, but then something changed and no one revisited the system to see how it could be re uh, improved. Um, sometimes we continue to do things a certain way out of habit. Um, and sometimes we create workarounds that seem to work well enough and then we forget to question it and, and continue to improve the process. So this point is important to keep in mind when you're talking with others about quality improvement. Sometimes it can seem like you're attacking someone for doing something uh, attacking someone for doing something wrong when it's really about improving the system. And then finally, quality improvement should be ongoing. You don't just improve something and forget about it. So even once you've improved something, there may be additional tweaks you can make to make it even better. So I'm going to briefly review some tools that I think are helpful. Um, and I'd like to point out that the American Society for Quality has many free tools. Um, and the link to the ASQ is on this slide. And we'll send out a PDF of the slides after the webinar in case you don't get a chance to write down the link. Um, but there are many quality improvement tools. And I've selected a few that I think are easy to understand and implement. And I've broken them down into two categories. So, the first category is understanding the problem, and the second category is planning for change. So the first tool is a patient flow diagram or a process map. It's pretty much what it sounds like. You map a patient's experience across the continuum of care, whether that's in your institution or across the network. Um, and I won't read through all of these questions, but you're trying to figure out what happens to the patient to identify where there might be gaps, redundancies, or obstacles. And this is just one way of thinking through a patient flow diagram. So what happens to a patient at each of these stages? At screening, think about what happens to the patient. How or where are they screened? What happens when there's abnormal finding? At diagnosis, think about what happens to the patient during and after treatment options are discussed. During treatment, what happens to the patient? Are there assessments that are done? How are issues managed? Who's managing those issues? Once treatment is done, you can think about um, what providers the patient sees, how information is communicated across providers, again, who is in charge of managing care. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Heather to talk about developing process maps here at GW. Hi, everyone. As Anne stated, I'm going to break down the process mapping a bit more to explain the steps behind how you can ultimately create the flow chart. I researched many different processes and approaches. One that I preferred was the Midland Cancer Control Project. They utilize the process mapping methodology developed by the Cancer Services Collaborative Improvement Partnership, 
which is a national health service program that makes improvements in cancer care. I ultimately decided that although the Midland District Health Board's methodology was comprehensive, the approach was really resource intensive. So I used their method, but I modified the approach a little bit. Key aspects that they did include were diagramming each step in the patient experience. Other key steps were forming a team of key stakeholders, establishing realistic goals, and creating the patient experience map. I'm going to walk you through how we approach this at GW. I engaged a team consisting of non-licensed navigators from the GW Cancer Institute, a nurse navigator and a nurse from the GW Hospital, and a social worker, nurses and physicians from GW Medical Faculty Associates. The GW Cancer Institute core team was the navigation team. We were the ones that met most frequently during this project. Many meetings were held full of conversation that described the ideal patient experience versus the actual patient experience, which resulted in identifying performance improvement projects. The broader group of stakeholders were engaged to validate project findings and ensure support for the resulting quality improvement initiatives. The GW Cancer Institute really focused initially on breast imaging and intervention center because this navigator was being asked by team members to assist with administrative tasks which were detracting her from focusing on true navigation. The maps, as um, Anne pointed out, were a useful tool to discuss this in a non-defensive manner, and it also highlighted the patient's needs better and how the radiology navigator could assist with meeting those needs. A main, yes, a main challenge throughout the course of this project was remaining focused on specific and achievable goals because the maps highlighted that cancer care involves a highly complex series of appointments, staff interactions, departments, and services, including referrals to outside organizations at times. However, the process maps were an opportunity to also show that the navigator's role is very critical in coordinating this cancer care, and it helped highlight how the navigators can lessen the fragmentation for patients. The main goal that we focused on was maximizing the impact of the patient navigation team by identifying the patient needs, care coordination gaps, and system fragmentation that the navigators could address. A critical goal was to coordinate a seamless cancer experience for each cancer patient. We selected process improvements that the navigators had control over initially in order to demonstrate their impact. Creating the maps is a process in and of itself, as we learned. Um, first, the navigators diagram the patient flow for each clinical area, including breast imaging, breast surgery, hematology, oncology, radiation oncology, and the survivorship clinic. Multiple drafts of the diagrams were discussed with the team, and opportunities were identified to best utilize each navigator and avoid duplication of work. The team examined when and how referrals are made, when the ideal time would be to refer to the Thriving After Cancer Survivorship Clinic, and the best process to assess barriers to care and screen for distress. Many different drafts were shared with staff until they agreed that the charts accurately represented the actual process for a breast cancer patient here. Themes emerged such as capacity limits of clinics and staff, lack of awareness of available psychosocial support for patients and families, risk of breakdown in communication across um, the care continuum. The identification of these themes served as a starting point for discussing quality improvement initiatives. Final drafts of the flowcharts were standardized and abbreviations were eliminated to ensure comprehension across departments. Here's an example of one of the least complicated maps, the radiation oncology process map. The main improvement identified here was ensuring patients knew about the American Cancer Society resource navigator and that the radiation oncology staff referred patients with barriers to care to this navigator. This map is a bit more complicated. It's the breast care center process. 
Um, the asterisks in these maps, I also wanted to point out, represent enhancements that were added after completion of the process map. In this slide, they're also highlighted in orange. A few initiatives that were discussed for improvements in the breast care center are the radiology procedures that need to be completed prior to surgery were taken over by the radiology navigator. And the Avon funded radiology navigator really was instrumental with this. She and the breast care center navigator began working more closely together, introducing patients to one another and making sure that authorizations were obtained for pre-surgery procedures. This really helped ensure that the process went more smoothly so there were no delays in getting patients to surgery. Another quality improvement prioritized was ensuring that patients were aware of the survivorship resources. And again, the breast care center navigator worked closely with the survivorship navigator and they implemented a process where the breast care center navigator now monthly mails letters to patients that have completed their surgery to inform them of the clinic and let them know about survivorship resources that are available to them. In the survivorship clinic, the main quality improvement discussed was how to improve patient knowledge and awareness of the survivorship resources by establishing processes in other clinics and making sure that patients were referred to the survivorship clinic. The project resulted in quality improvement initiatives for each member of the navigation team. Listed here are a few of the QI projects for the radiology clinic. I didn't share the radiology process map because it's so complicated, you wouldn't even be able to see a thing on the slide. But these quality improvements in this slide um, show you some of what came out of the discussion on that process map. The quality improvements identified here will improve handoffs between navigators across clinical departments and ensure timelier access to necessary follow-up care. So the GW mapping project focused on how patient navigators could meaningfully contribute to improving the quality of cancer care. The project did result in adjustments to navigator duties to ensure navigators were focused on addressing the gaps most important to ensuring patients receive timely patient-centered care. One important piece to note is that it is an ongoing process and we are still revisiting these maps and initiating new quality improvement projects, tweaking some of our approaches to them. So it's definitely a continuous quality improvement. But um, the strength of this continuous approach is the flexibility to respond to the unique needs of patients. And you have the capacity to adapt things as patient needs and system needs change. So it's definitely a patient-centered approach. And uh, before I turn it over to Anne again, I just wanted to point out that our mapping project here was supported by the Avon Foundation for Women. And our navigation program here receives support from Avon Komen and the American Cancer Society, as well as GW. Now Anne's going to highlight a few more useful tools you can use in your programs to implement some quality improvement. Great. Thanks, Heather. Um, so the next tool is the fishbone diagram, which is also called Ishikawa, or a cause-effect diagram. Um, so essentially, you just ask why a whole bunch of times. And this tool is especially good when you're trying to identify a problem um, and when a team falls into a rut. So this is a blank template, and I'll walk you through an example on the next slide. Um, but the first diagram provides some sample categories, and the second one is the same but with categories that you identify. So either way, you start by identifying the problem. So in our example on the next slide, the problem that we're going to use is patients not adhering to treatment. So then you identify the causes of the problem. What could some of those causes be? Are there specific barriers, psychosocial issues, provider issues? And then finally, you provide more detail about the causes that you've just identified. Um, so here's a completely fictitious example that I created, um, but it's really for thinking about patient navigation programs. And as I mentioned on the last slide, the problem that is discussed here is that patients aren't adhering to treatment. 
Um, so I came up with some causes that I grouped under barriers to care, staff, resources, process, psychosocial, and transportation issues. So I then provided more detail about the challenges within each of those six areas. So for barriers to care, the challenges might be transportation, language, health insurance. Um, for some of the staff barriers, it, it could be that there aren't enough navigators, or maybe the navigators need more training, or maybe a social worker is needed. Um, so with this diagram of the possible causes of the problem, you can better identify solutions. And like with the patient flow diagrams, you can also do this as a group, and you can use this tool to diagram the best case scenario um, and identify gaps and needs. So the final tool for this section is a Pareto chart. And you've probably actually heard of the Pareto principle, even if you didn't know the name for it. But it basically states that 20% of the factors cause 80% of the problems. Um, so if you're trying to figure out where to focus your efforts, you should identify the biggest leverage points or the few things that can make a really big impact. Um, so this is particularly a good tool when analyzing data about the frequency of problems or causes in a process. Um, when there are many problems or causes and you want to focus on the most significant, uh, it's good when analyzing broad causes by looking at their specific components. And it's a really good tool for communicating with others about your data. Um, so we're going to have Heather walk us through an example um, of what you can do with a Pareto chart in just a minute. So this is what a Pareto chart looks like. Um, imagine that you're trying to remove or improve, improve barrier resolution for your patients seen by patient navigators. So first you'd want to know what the biggest problems are for the patient population. And you also probably want to focus on the top couple of things that would really provide the most benefit to patients because we have limited time and resources. Um, so on this chart, the bars that you see show you the number of each barrier encountered. So uh, if you look at language barriers, which is the first bar all the way to the left, um, there are a little more than 200 barriers. Um, for financial and insurance barriers, just to the right of that one, it's right at 200. Um, literacy and scheduling are around 180 barriers and so on. Um, so the line that goes across the top shows you the cumulative percentage of barriers. So starting again on the far left, you can see that language barriers alone account for about 16% of all of the barriers encountered by patients. Um, the bar next to it, language, or if you look further down, um, you'll see for the financial and insurance that uh, language plus financial and insurance barriers together account for 31%. Um, so you can see that if you just address the first two barriers on the chart, that could help you remove about a third of all barriers. Um, so essentially, the Pareto chart helps you prioritize so that you're not spending uh, the bulk of your time focusing on something like, in this case, housing, which is all the way over to the right, which is not as problematic. And it also provides a great visual if you're trying to convince others of the need for certain improvements. Um, so it very easily and clearly conveys the high priority areas. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Heather to talk about um, how we've used this here. Thanks. So as Anne pointed out, if you just took language, financial, literacy, and scheduling care from the GW Cancer Institute barriers and worked to eliminate them, we would have more than half of the barrier issues that our patients are struggling with handled. So we've been focusing on these four this year. And some of the things that we've done to address the most common barriers identified in our chart is for the language and the literacy, we're working to develop a patient treatment binder and ensuring its literacy level is appropriate and translating it into, into different languages. We're starting with Spanish. And we're going to pilot this binder with the navigators. They are going to sit with the patient go through it with them, explain the different clinics and the different treatment points here, and um, a survey will be completed to assess its usefulness. Another thing we are trying is parking vouchers. We received some, a donation of parking vouchers 
we are going to offer those to patients, and we're also going to continue offering Metro transportation assistance to ease the financial barriers to care that patients have identified as a top barrier. And lastly, we are implementing a return on investment study to demonstrate the cost savings the navigator brings the institution by ensuring correct and timely scheduling for patients. And that, like Ann said, is um, aimed to show staff how much time is spent on helping patients schedule their care. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Ann, who will explain one more helpful quality improvement tool. Great. Thanks, Heather. Um, so these next two frameworks are um, for helping you actually implement improvements. And the first one we'll talk about is the PDCA cycle, which you might have also heard as PDSA. Um, but it stands for plan, do, check or study, and act. So you plan a change, implement a pilot, and you want to start small so you don't throw all of your resources at a solution that may not work. Um, and then you look at the results and figure out what you want to do. Do you want to expand the project? Do you want to change it? Or maybe you want to abandon it and start over um, completely from the beginning. Um, so sometimes if you have a program up and running, you can start by looking at the results. And in that case, it's the same cycle, but it's just called the CAP do. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Heather to talk about the PDCA, PDCA cycle here at GW in action. So one example I thought of highlighting using PDCA in the Cancer Institute is how we approach the distress screening process. It is important to point out that HEMONC had already implemented distress screening in their clinic, so we already had a mini PDCA because we knew the process was working there. So we decided to expand and refine their process to other clinical areas. The Breast Care Center was the next clinic we aimed to implement it in because the navigator there was tightly integrated into the clinical operation. Our plan really was to implement a standard approach to distress screening across the different clinics and departments here and the medical faculty associates. GW Cancer Institute led the standardization of the process and really um, drafted the policy and took the lead on encouraging all the stakeholders to discuss how we were going to approach the distress screening at GW. The psychosocial services representative, who is the social worker for the medical faculty's associates, presented the policy to the cancer committee for approval. So our plan was, um, key parts of the plan that we discussed was what tool we were going to use. And the NCC and distress thermometer was chosen as the preferred tool because, like I said, the Hemont Clinic was already using this tool. And you know, when you're doing change, it's easy to change as little as possible until you have some wins. So we admit that tool is not perfect, but it was working well in that clinic, and we decided to roll it out in the breast care center as well. We also thought using the same tool would make it easier to track patients' distress and needs over time. We also spent a lot of time discussing how the scores would be addressed. What would be the intervention for the team based on where patients scored? So all the clinics agreed to follow the NCCN guidelines. And I highlighted on here what the staff approach would be for each low, moderate, or high score. The next thing that was standardized was the navigator's approach with the patient. We spent time discussing this and standardizing this amongst the clinic. When we got to the do stage, <laughs> we, we, I can tell you that the process ensured that patients are screened for emotional distress and barriers to care. The process definitely didn't, did help to have a standardized approach to the interventions and to the process in the different clinics. It definitely did 
help the navigators connect with patients so that they could assist with barriers and um, help with their distress according to their specialties. There's, the navigators are still having weekly team meetings with, uh, I believe there's a couple of nurses and the social worker and the navigators are all coming to the table every week to help troubleshoot and, and discuss the referrals as a team. The check phase, as part of our checking, we track the scores and compare them across the clinic, as you can see here. So the breast care center is the light blue and the hematology oncology is more of the navy blue. We also, as part of the check phase, looked at the number of problems the patients were reporting and again, same thing, you can see the breast care center is the light blue and the hematology oncology is the navy. Practical and emotional issues, if you're wondering, are the majority of patient problems we have noted so far. Um, other things that we looked at in the check phase, some of the challenges we noted is that not every patient chooses to participate in screening. They either decline or it's just not an appropriate time for them because maybe they're too upset with the diagnosis or they don't have enough time that day. They have to go on to further testing before they decide on their treatment plan, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something that we're still tweaking and discussing and maybe modifying our approach. The follow-up is also a, a challenge, and I guess the reassessment part of, you know, when do you rescreen, do you rescreen, if you're on any of the listservs, I'm sure you see a lot of these questions go around, so it's certainly not unique to us here, but, um, and then how to really kind of manage that caseload. One of our navigators is using a color-coded system to prioritize her follow-up. Um, the other challenge is, as I said before, we really would like to track the patient's distress and needs across the continuum, across the different clinics, and that documentation and tracking, we're still trying to figure out the best way to approach that. We plan to implement a case management software system called OncoNav to assist with this. Um, so we're, we're pretty early in our process here. Um, like I said, you definitely we plan to continue to do the distress screening, but we have noticed a few tweaks are needed to the process. Currently, we're tracking the most distress, the most recent dis distress score and date, the intervention, but we would like to compare the screens easily. So we are working towards monitoring distress scores over time across the clinic. We are working on improving the documentation and tracking for treatment, and we're going to be doing the PDCA again. <laughs> so as I said, the navigation software we plan to implement will help with these next steps, but it's a continuous process. Now I'm going to turn it over to Ann one last time. Great. Thanks, Heather. Um, so this is the last tool that we'll talk about. It's Six Sigma Demaic, and it's very similar to PDCA, um, and it's just another process that you can use for improvement. So you start off by defining the problem, which includes the scope and the implications of not doing anything. Um, then you measure what's currently happening to get a good sense of how well things are or aren't working. You analyze the results from what you just measured, so you're looking at what's working well, what isn't working well. Uh, based on that analysis, you make a change to the process, which can be a pilot. Um, and then you control the process, which means creating consistent measures and a tracking process. So we'll walk through just a quick example. Um, and this one happens to focus on survivorship. So to use Six Sigma Demaic, you would define the problem. So the problem here is, is that not all patients are receiving um, survivorship care plans after treatment. And to meet the Commission on Cancer standard, you want all survivors to have a survivorship care plan. And remember, you should also be thinking about the cost of doing nothing. So 
In this case, by doing nothing, patients potentially have poorer quality of life without any intervention. So to measure what's happening, you could do a survey of physicians uh, to see how many patients are receiving survivorship care plans. And you could also do a survey of survivors to see whether they know about their follow-up needs. And then let's say that physicians report giving out only a handful of care plans, and then the survivors report not being prepared for survivorship. Um, so th that analysis indicates that the process isn't really working how we want it to work. So based on that analysis, you decide to make a change to the process, which again, this could be a pilot. Um, so based on this information, you decide to implement a survivorship care plan process. And maybe you actually decide to focus it just in urology because you have the most support for it there. Um, and you also could decide to include a survivor pre-post survey to assess knowledge change. So the last step is controlling the process. And um, you could decide to have quarterly meetings where you can assess the number of survivorship care plans given, or you could look at the percentage of patients receiving survivorship care plans. Um, and then you could also look at uh, knowledge change in cancer survivors because you um, did the pre-post surveys. So that's just one other example of a tool for implementing um, quality and process improvements. Um, so I know that was a brief overview, but thank you so much, Heather, for providing some really great concrete examples of how these tools can be used in practice. Um, so we do have a few minutes left for question and answer. So you can use the Q&A box that's on the lower right side of your screen if you want to submit a question. Um, and then while we're waiting for a few questions to come in, I wanted to mention again that we will be sending out the archived recording of the webinar along with the slides and a brief evaluation after the meeting. Um, so it looks like we do have one question um, for Heather. So Heather, could you talk a little bit more about how long the initial um, process mapping process took? <laughs> That's one of the key challenges to the process mapping. I, I think it's a great tool, and it really, like I said, brings down people's defenses so that you can talk about system problems rather than making it personal. But as I said, that's really why I chose to modify the Midland Cancer Control Project's approach, because theirs was years in the making. And we did ours probably within a year. OK, great. All right, does anybody else have questions? Oh, here's an interesting one. So is one tool uh, more successful than others? So that's a great question. Um, I think that the tools are um, useful in different situations. So we talked about the fishbone diagram being good when you're trying to find the cause of a problem. Um, the, the process maps are really good when you're trying to understand the, the process for things, and um, you're trying to find places where you can make an impact. Um, and then the, the Pareto chart is really good when um, you need to show data and when you have limited resources and you're trying to identify the priorities um, that you want to focus on. So I think that, that the tools should just be used depending on what you're looking for, but they can all be used successfully. It's a great question. All right, OK, we have another similar question. Are any of these tools easier to do than the other tools? Um, you know, again, I think it's probably just going to depend on how you're using it. And um, it'll also depend on how um, excited people are internally. If people are generally on board with process mapping, for example, um, that, that might not take as long. But if you're spending time gathering stakeholders and getting people on board, that it might um, make the process take a little bit longer. And some of these things, like the um, Pareto chart, really depends on you having um, the right data. So if you don't have the right data for that, then that one could be kind of hard to pull together. But again, I think it's going to really depend on your situation and what it is that you're trying to do. All right, and it looks like we have one other question. 
Um, it's what are some of the challenges with implementing quality improvement like process mapping? I'm going to turn that one to Heather to see if she has any thoughts about that. So I, again, would say time. I think it's pretty resource intensive. It can be. Um, it helps to have me leading it and drafting the maps and um, having someone kind of lead the charge. I think it can also be a challenge to keep teams motivated with, with a long-term kind of process improvement as this one is. But I also find focusing on the smaller changes you can accomplish first helps. And then you can you know, celebrate that success and move on to some larger ones, I guess. Great. All right. It looks like we don't have any more questions. So um, thank you, everybody, for participating in the webinar today. Um, I just wanted to put this slide up again one more time about some of our free CA SNAP resources. Um, and again, we'll be sending out a recording of this webinar along with a PDF of the slides um, and a brief evaluation form um, after the webinar ends. So thank you so much. <laughs>